Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for this special Connectpreneur Masterclass. Top 10 Sales Lessons from Fred Diamond's Sales Game Changers podcast. And our instructor today is Fred, who is a co-founder of Institute for Excellence in Sales. He's the host and producer of the award-winning Sales Game Changers podcast. I'm Tian Wong. I'm founder and host of the Big Idea Connectpreneur community. We are a global community of over 25,000 investors, founders, and business leaders from around the world. And we help companies and alternative investment management companies raise money through our network of 4,000 now accredited private investors, qualified purchasers, angels, and family offices throughout the U.S. And today's masterclass is scheduled for 60 minutes. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for question and answer. So if you have any questions for our instructor, Diamond, send them directly into the group chat, or you can private message with our co-host and Connectpreneur Assistant Community Manager, Avery North, or you can just go ahead and raise your hand and ask the question in person or live once we start the Q&A, and then you can ask the question yourself. A little bit about Fred. Fred's a good friend. He's a longtime Connectpreneur supporter. He's an educator, a community builder, all-around great guy. He's a critically acclaimed author, and he's got an amazing sales podcast. I think it's probably one of the top sales podcasts I've ever heard. Uh, it's called Sales Game Changers Podcast. We'll put the link to join uh, to sign up for that in the in the chat box. Uh, Fred is a world-renowned expert on B2B and professional sales. The IES, Institute for Excellence in Sales, helps B2B employers attract, retain, motivate, and elevate top-tier sales performers. It's also, it's also a center of excellence for corporate women in sales best practices. Uh, Fred is also an advocate for Lyme disease treatment. He's a frequent writer for LymeDisease.org, and his books, Love, Hope, Lyme, What Family Members, Partners, and Friends Who Love a Chronic Lyme Survivor Need to Know, and his other book, Insights for Sales Game Changers, Lessons from the Most Important Sales Leaders on the Planet. They're all available on Amazon. Uh, I've read them. They're fantastic. I highly recommend. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'd, I'd like to hand it over to, to Fred. Fred, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Tien, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to see some familiar faces. So uh, let's get started. Today, we're talking about the, the top 10 sales lessons from my award-winning Sales Game Changers podcast. We're going to have fun. It's going to be breezy. We're going to get uh, into some depth here as well. But uh, first, a little bit about me. Tien, you gave a great introduction, so uh, I will go into some of that, although I will go into some of that. Uh, I run people, what's called the Institute for Excellence in Sales. I'm based in Fairfax, Virginia. If you're in the D.C. area, right by the, uh, the government's Center. Our mission at the Institute for Excellence in Sales is to help employers attract, retain, motivate, and elevate top-tier sales talent. Uh, one of the things that we're most known for is our global women in sales programs. So uh, prior to the pandemic, we were doing a lot of programs in D.C. Now we do programs for corporate women in sales all around the globe. We've had women from Europe, from Asia, all across the United States to uh, participating. We like to say that we're the center of excellence for corporate women in sales best practices. The other thing that we're known for is we have a big award event and we have a couple of designations, premier young sales leader. We have something called premier sales employer. And we're announcing next week on March 30th, TN and everybody, our premier women in sales employer PYs. We search for the best companies uh, that have the best programs for sales organizations specifically to attract women in sales. As you see in that picture there, some of you may recognize the great Jay Nussbaum. Jay led Oracle's public sector, Xerox's public sector. He created a company that went to Accenture Federal. We have an award called the Jay Nussbaum Rising Sales Star Award as well. And we do a big award event. He's going to blush here, but every June. So this year, June 9th, we're going to be holding our 13th annual award event. We recognize some great sales leaders from companies like HP and LinkedIn. We're very excited to have our very first Entrepreneur Sales Leader Award. And it is our Connectpreneur host and everybody's friend, Tian Wang. And uh, this is the first time we are giving out this particular award. It's going to be June 9th in the morning at the McLean Hilton, and you will receive more information about that. 
Some of the companies that we work with are usually bigger companies, Intel, Dell, Amazon. And we're going to be talking about some of the lessons. A little bit about me as well. I'm from Philadelphia. So I live in Virginia, but I'm from Philly. I still think in terms of Philly. It's uh, been a great year to be a Phillies fan. Whenever I drive up 95 and I get past Wilmington, I become a different person, people say. But I'm thrilled to be from Philly. As Tien mentioned, I'm an author of two books, two completely divergent books. I'm the only person in the history of the world who published a book on sales performance improvement and Lyme disease awareness on April, I'm sorry, August of last year. And uh, I want to talk about the Lyme book in a little bit, how it's actually helped me with sales. One of the things I like to do is to drive around and take pictures of people I know reading my books. Some of you may recognize the great Art Medici in the center there. He was a frequent uh, participate, uh, participant in Connectpreneur. It's a good way to, to do some marketing. Since I wrote a book with the word love in the title, whenever I see those Virginia love signs or in Philly, wherever they might be, I usually take a picture. I post it on Instagram and Facebook, sometimes Twitter, and I get uh, hundreds of people acknowledging that. I've done this conversation on tons of podcasts. I've been on 12 podcasts recently, TN, where I've spoken. They've been business and sales focus, focus, and I've spoken about Lyme disease. So that's something that's given me a different level of attention in the market. I brought my kids into it. That's my daughter, Abby. She, uh, I hope if you... Uh, People here buy the book. I hope you don't fall asleep, but uh, she's uh, supportive of what I'm doing as well. Bring your kids involved. And the other thing that I've done, of course, on Trick or Treat, I gave out my books to the neighborhood kids. They were all thrilled. I think this one was thrilled. I couldn't really tell because she was wearing a mask. But I'm approaching episode number 600 of the Sales Game Changers podcast. We've had over 2 million interactions with downloads, with retweets, with LinkedIn posts, LinkedIn comments. We were very fortunate to have been recognized by Yesware in 2022 as having the best podcast for sales leaders. And the way that we used to do it prior to the pandemic, I was driving all over the Beltway. I would carry my ATR 2100 mics, my Zoom 5 recorders. And you know what? This was a top of funnel thing for me. We're going to talk about the results, but speaking about sales, one of the things that you want to do is you want to get in the office of your customer. And sales is really about, it's not about the close, it's not about the transaction, it's about the process getting to those places. You may need 40 closes along the way to quote unquote close a customer. So I literally uh, reached out to dozens and then hundreds of sales leaders, not just in DC, but as far away as Tennessee, Philadelphia, New York. One of my best customers ever was a sales VP, and I interviewed sales VPs, was a sales VP up in New York, a company called Datasite, and they've become one of our best customers. This is the way that I began my sales process, inviting sales VPs to be on my Sales Game Changers podcast. Didn't know I was going to do 600 episodes in the beginning. This was the first time a lot of these people were focused on this. Pandemic kicks in. Obviously, I wasn't able to go to people's offices. So we did things over Zoom or WebEx or go to webinar. Some of you may recognize Casey Coleman. She's now at Salesforce. She was the CIO of the GSA. And we're doing these podcasts all the time. We post them typically on Monday and Friday on the usual places, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, et cetera. But it's given me the opportunity to talk to my prospects, which are VPs of sales at companies that have enterprise sales approaches. So uh, to do this masterclass, we were thinking about what are the top 10 lessons that we've learned from the sales leaders who have appeared on our podcast. And just as an FYI, we actually posted a show today with a sales VP at BMC Software, one of my prospects. We interviewed her, did a great show, we're now in relationships. So we're going to be talking about the top 10 lessons that we've learned. I do want to give a caveat to everybody listening here. This isn't like a top 10 list you could find by Googling the top 10 things. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you got to listen, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you right now, it's about execution. We have a lot of smart people listening to me today. I interview smart people. My customers are really smart people. Sales is a process. Sales is a profession. If you're going to be a professional, you need to train. You need to prepare. So I'm going to say some things to you that we've learned that the top sales leaders in the world have uttered to me on my podcast. And it may seem to you, yeah, obviously. Well, it's not obvious because you got to put it into play. 
and you got to execute. So I want to make sure that that caveat is out there. All right, we got 10 things. Empathy. So you may recognize Andy Miller. He's local. He's the grit guy. He's been a guest on the podcast a couple of times. The way I'm going to be doing this presentation is we, we deduce the top 10 things. We're going to take the highlight, and then we're going to provide some evidence that we've gotten from the South Game Changers podcast. Now, empathy is something that uh, really rose when the pandemic kicked in. And sales is all about empathy. It's not sympathy. It's not feeling sorry for your customer. It's understanding what your customer is going through. It's having a deep understanding because you're preparing, you're researching, you're talking to people. You're not just showing up and saying, I have this cool technology, this cool device, or even I'm from Salesforce, you know, do you want to buy? It's being able to put yourself in the customer's place so that you understand what they're going through. And it's really interesting because when the pandemic kicked in, that became the big word. We need to be empathetic for everybody. And I remember we did a podcast, TN, it was about two years ago. One of our guests, I'm sorry, someone in the audience asked the question to one of our guests who was a senior VP of sales of a well-known company. He said, um, when can we start taking a break from all this empathy that we're doing? And the VP of sales who was on my show gave a great answer. He said, if you are unempathetic, if you're and an empathetic uh, stalemate or something, take a break. Sales is always about empathy. And it goes into other areas, again, of, of pre prepar preparation, of research, of talking. You need to know before you meet with the customer what they're dealing with. And that is empathy. Critical word. As a matter of fact, when I wrote my book, the sale, uh, uh, Insights for Sales Game Changers, Lessons from the Top Sales Leaders on the Planet, what we did is we, we did a search on the top 30 words. We used an AI tool to do that. Uh, not words like the and is, but words that are appropriate for sales. We came up with 30 words that were uttered. At the time, we had researched 450 of our episodes, 10, and empathy was used in close to 200 of the episodes of the 400 we have done. We're over 600 now. We're going to be posting episode 600 in a couple of weeks. But uh, empathy and, again, words like teamwork, leadership, et cetera. And the book gives a lot of those examples. Empathy was the number one word that was listed. The other skill that comes out of empathy is listening. You know, before the pandemic, when I was going to sales leaders' offices and interviewing them face to face, I would always ask, what is your superpower? Why are you such a great sales leader? Three out of four would say, I'm a great listener. And in the beginning, I would say, okay, great, you're a great listener. And they would say things like the 66% solution. You have two ears and one mouth. Use them in that order. And I kind of took it for granted. Then I got so many of these sales leaders saying listening that I would go back and I would say, well, how are you a great listener? And they would say things like they're curious. You know, curiosity. We even did a sales uh, game changers episode on the science of curiosity. You know, really being curious about your customer's business. Where are they going? Where are the challenges? What are their customers asking them? And the other thing as it relates to listening is coming prepared with great questions. All the great sales leaders that I talked to would always say they did so much preparation. They knew the right questions and they weren't BS questions like what keeps you up at night or what is the biggest pain? They knew before they got into the meetings with the customers what those things were. So empathy, listening, preparation. I know we're taking questions throughout and uh, if you have any questions, submit them and, and Avery, you know, feel free to interject at any point. Number two, number two. We're all trying to get to the C-suite. We're all trying to get to the decision maker. And so much of the day is spent thinking, how we got this great message, we got this critical technology, how do we get to the C-suite? So on the show that we did with Casey Coleman, I showed you her picture before. She was a CIO at GSA for seven years. She's been with Salesforce for a number of years now. She's a senior leader, senior VP in their um, solutions center. And at the end of every podcast, we, you know, we talk for about 25 minutes. And I always say, give us a final thought, an action item, something that people can do today. And Casey said, which was something that we've heard so many times, as a former executive in the government, senior executive, 
Her day is jam-packed. If it wasn't on her calendar, it didn't happen. And one thing that we we actually did a show devoted to what is going on in the mind of the CIO or the CXO that you're trying to get to. And they have to deal up and they have to deal across and they have to deal down to their direct reports and they have to deal with vendors. And when you talk about the vendor list, you're talking about you know the top tiers, the Microsofts, the Oracles, the Salesforces, whoever they may be spending, you know, some cases hundreds of millions of dollars with. And then of course, you know, you throw in a pandemic TN and then you got to be dealing with your employees and you got to be understanding what's going on with them and what's going on at home. I did an interview with the VP of sales for public sector of d and I'm sure everybody here watching uh, is familiar with Dun & Bradstreet. This was about a year ago. It was June of 2022. And I asked him, what is the biggest challenge that you and your C-level peers are dealing with? And he said, it's managing the fatigue of our employees and managing the mental health of our employees. Tien, every third show, we talk about mental illness. We talk about mental health. It's such an important topic that I even did a show on getting past trauma. You know, salespeople are stuck in a lot of cases with trauma, childhood trauma. Of course, that came up in my line book as well. But Casey said, you know, if you're trying to get to me, you need to understand that if you're a new company, if you're a new vendor, if you have a new technology, you know, you're 120th on the list. And I have 120 people in front of you. I might be interested if you get through to me at the right place. We actually had a couple CIOs on the show, the CIO of Interior and the CIO, the former CIO of, uh, of DHS. And I asked them, what do you want from vendors, right? And you would think they would say your corporate strategy, your product strategy. They said, I'll take a meeting with you, or I'll even talk to you at Starbucks if you help me understand how to work with your customer. Uh, how to work with your company. How does the procurement process work? What is the easiest way to get to support if our people need it? How can I get a meeting with your C-level people so that uh, I can get some action into our play? But that's the one thing that you need to understand. It's like, we may have a great solution here and we want to get to the C-level suite. We want to get to the decision maker, but the decision maker is so swamped with so many things, so many other competing priorities. And the other thing that we keep hearing too that relates to this as well, a lot of people don't realize this, there's not one person at your customer that you need to talk to, especially if you're uh, in an early stage company. Some cases to make an enterprise decision, to end, there's like eight or 10 people who are involved. And I just don't mean procurement. I mean people on the IT and people on the business side and people in you know finance, et cetera. You know, sometimes we think we had a great meeting. We had a great first meeting. I feel that way too. If I talk to a prospect and it's great, it's like, we had a great meeting. It's a 50% chance they're going to become customers. Well, you know what? In most cases, especially with enterprise technology, there's six, eight people that we need to buy off on. And they might be on vacation and they may be focused on other things. So as Casey said at the end of this particular show, don't get discouraged. Figure out a way to show value. You may need to come up in the organization, but if it's going to be valuable, which we're going to be talking about, eventually you'll get to me. Keep being persistent. Keep making it happen. All right. Number three, this is the great Mark Hunter. He's known as the sales hunter. We've been uh, good friends with Mark for a number of years. It's a challenging time to prospect right now. So a large part of what we've done over the years at the Institute for Excellence in Sales is talk about prospecting, ways to get through on the phone, ways to get through with an email cadence, whatever it might be, using LinkedIn, whatever it might be. Mark is actually a uh, world-class prospector. He's written a book called um, High Performance Prospecting. He's just a fabulous guy. He has a technique. He calls it his 58 and 2 technique, where he says the best time to make an outreach to a prospect is at the 58th minute because he just completed a meeting or the two-minute on the hour because they're obviously not going to be in a meeting. But right now, going after new business, it's extremely different. All of the companies that we talk to that are trying to find new business, it's very, very difficult. Companies that are customers of ours are still challenged with trying to figure out how do they, how do they really emerge of the last three years. Almost every company that I talk to, these vendors, these IT companies, they're all trying to figure out how do we emerge? And they're trying to figure it out because their customer is trying to figure out how do we now emerge? And their customer's customer is trying to figure it out. So going after new business, new things that people need, 
is extremely difficult. So the key recommendation is to go to past customers and go to people that you've done business with before. Those relationships are usually going to open. People are open to you. new stuff. I'm going to be honest with you. It's really tough. People are finding new business opportunities depending on what you're selling, but you know, beginning a process with a brand new customer, prospecting has gotten so hard for so many different reasons. Everybody is focused in 2023. We're doing today's masterclass on uh, March uh, 23rd, I think it is, of 2023. And that is what everybody is focused on. How do we emerge? How do we be in the hybrid world? How do we work with our people? How do we manage their health? Of course, obviously, there's some macro factors going into play right now with, with layoffs, et cetera. So you got to figure out how do we get to our existing customers? All right. The great Ron Police. Ron has been at many companies, Apple, SAP, NS2, Plan. Now, everybody here who's watching, I'm looking at some of the names here. We got some amazing investors. We got some great company founders. We got some great people who support great companies. Like I said, I got some friends. Hi, buy my books. Uh, planning. Everybody here on the masterclass is involved with some type of strategic planning. I've even hired uh, one person who I see on today's uh, masterclass to help me with my master plan for a uh, master strategic plan for the corporate business. You got to have a sales plan. Ron gave a great answer here when I asked him, what is your biggest recommendation for how people can be successful? He said, not just your sales plan, but your plan for your life, for your family, for your friends. How do you want to be in the community? How do you want to be? Uh, how should your spirituality arrange? But you got to sit down and you got to have a sales plan. And it could be, you know what? Could be on a spreadsheet. It doesn't really matter. You don't need to invest in huge technologies. And there needs to be a detailed plan on how you're going to be getting to the marketplace and who is going to be involved and what does the customer need and what are the messages that we're going to be communicating to them. You know, a lot of people think that sales is about charisma and courage. Any about that. It's definitely about courage. You got to have the courage to pick up the phone. You got to have the courage to put yourself out there. Same way that I'm posting all those pictures of every friend that I have on Facebook, you know, holding my uh, my Lime and my sales book. You got to have the courage to put down the plan of who do we need to get to at these customers? What is our target list? Something simple like that. That all needs to be documented, needs to be shared, needs, needs to be thought through, can't be winged. It really has to be focused and developed. And that comes up time and time again. Now, the plan may change. And everybody knows the great Mike Tyson quote, you know, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. So it may need to shift. You may need to morph, but you got to be in the process of doing that as well. So a lot of people don't think about a sales plan. They think about just get on the phone, just pick people up, go to a networking event, you know, go to an AFCA event, whatever it might be, whatever your industry is. The plan needs to be documented. It needs to be thought through. It needs to be communicated with your partners. You know, TN's been a sponsor of the Institute for Excellence in Sales over the years. I've shared my strategic plans with him and dozens of other people to find out who do you know? Who can you help me get the introductions to? We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. All right. Put down the baby, pick up the phone. People ask me, what is the number one sales tool? It's the phone. I say this all the time. LinkedIn is great. Helps me identify prospects. I can do LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn outreach. I'm a, I'm a premier user. I've used Sales Navigator. Uh, email is still important. Doesn't happen until you pick up the phone. This guy's name is Alec Goldfein, uh, and we talk about that all the time. Uh, it, the phone is the number one tool. People are surprised sometimes to get a, uh, to get a call. Uh, I always recommend uh, people pick up the phone. Alex wrote a book. It's called Pick Up the Phone and Sell. And his story here, it was fascinating. It wasn't necessarily about the sales process and obviously cold, not cold calling, but talking to prospects, trying to get appointments via Zoom, whatever it might be. His approach was very simple. His approach was pick up the phone every day and call three friends from your business world. Three people that might have been customers before, three people that like you, that will take your call, that will be surprised that you're physically, physically picking them up the phone and calling, and you're not really going with an agenda. Now, of course, in the back of your head, your agenda is you want to move your business forward, et cetera. And I actually tried this after I had him on the podcast about a year ago, episode 485, whatever it is. And by the way, if you're a uh, attentive or detailed watcher, you've noticed that I've changed the... Uh, the logo of my podcast. This one was an older show. Uh, you can see on the bottom right, the new logo for the, for the podcast. So I tried what Alex recommended. I pick up the phone, Intel 
was a sponsor of the Institute for Excellence in Sales. We now call our sponsors partners. I hadn't spoken to my partner in a while, uh, picked up the phone. He answered. We spoke for an hour. He was so appreciative that he renewed his corporate sponsorship on the spot. So whenever people ask me, what do I use? I always say the number one tool, it's this, it's the phone. You've got to engage in conversations. Yeah, if you're in good relationship, a couple LinkedIn or a couple emails might move you to the next place. Almost invariably, you got to be with them. You got to be meeting with them and you got to have conversations. Sales is all about TN. It's all about the next conversation. You know, people think it's about close, the transaction, the moment when the contract gets signed and the customer says, I'm in. Sales is 40 sales along the way. There's a book uh, called The Perfect Close by a guy named James Muir, The Perfect Close. So you're thinking it's about that moment when I say to you, here's the contract, please sign it. And they sign it. You got 40 closes sometimes along the way, you know, especially for some of the startup type companies that are involved with Connectpreneur. You know, you want that deal early, obviously. Yeah, it might take you a year, two, three, you know, to be able to keep moving. And everything is a win. Getting a conversation with the customer, getting a return email nowadays, that's a win. Celebrate that. Use it for the next step. I'm going to talk about relationships. You know, Connectpreneur, other organizations do a great job bringing people together. Prior to the pandemic, we used to do live events around the D.C. Beltway that will get 200 people. We did 50 events in 2020, TN, where we brought people together. Some events had 15 people, networking, mastermind. Some had 500, like our award event, where we're going to be recognizing you. Uh, relationships are still important, especially at the early stage, when you're trying to get as many meetings as possible. You're trying to get as many conversations as possible. But it's not the relationship that's going to lead to the sale. The relationship will get you in the game, hopefully. It'll get you meeting, get someone to pay attention to your Zoom still matter, but really the value that you're providing, which we're going to be talking about, is the critical thing. So you got to stay developing, keep developing those racial relationships and understanding which ones are important and which ones are going to be help you, which kind of goes back to the sales plan that we talked about before. But just having like a big network, that ain't going to do thumbs, that ain't going to do it for you. You need to have the sales process in place and your plan in place to take advantage of these relationships. And also the critical thing is knowing what to tell the people who want to help you, right? I've been in meetings, probably everybody here on this call has been in meetings where you're in a relationship and you say, what, what do you need? I need to meet CEOs. Introduce me to any CEO that you need. All right. I'm not going to introduce you to every CEO that you want to meet because I need to know if it's going to be a good use of time. If you have a message right now, that's going to be critical for them. What is valuable that you're communicating right now? What do you want me to tell the people in my network if they ask for introductions. A lot needs to go into that process as well. All right. Passion. Take your passion. Make it happen. Every morning, since my daughter was in kindergarten, I would say to her, take your passion and make it happen. She's in college now. She's a junior. You saw her before holding my books. Uh, every morning, I sent her a text message. T-Y-P-A-M-I-H. Take your passion and make it happen. Those of you from the 80s recognize that's from the movie called Flash Dance. You got to be passionate. You got to have energy. You got to be passionate about what you're bringing. Once you get those meetings, right? Once you're engaged, once you're in the room with somebody, you know, you got to show them that you care about them, that you care about what you're bringing them, that you've done the research to know that your tool, your technology, your solution is going to help them achieve whatever it might be. This young lady is named uh, Radhika Shukla. She's with Microsoft. She's Microsoft's top salesperson to the mid market. She's based in uh, she's based in Detroit. We did a great interview with her. You know, be bold, be fearless, embrace change, take risks. Satya, who's a CEO, of course, of Microsoft, learn it all. You know, as a matter of fact, I referred before to the award that we're doing in honor of Jay Nussbaum. Uh, when I interviewed Ron Police before, I asked him for a lesson from Jay, and he said, "Be bold." You know, be out there. If you're selling something, you got to own it. Be enthusiastic, be passionate, be energized. You know, you don't want to jump up on the table and start screaming at a sales meeting. You're going to get kicked out, but you need to show because you only get that many opportunities. You don't get a ton of opportunities. Sometimes you might just get one. And if you show up with, you know, trying to play cool and not showing the passion for the customer and what they're trying to achieve, you ain't going to get anywhere. Take your passion. Make it happen. Be energized. Everything is energy. All right. Two more slides here. 
Some of you may know a company that's in Northern Virginia. It actually got sold a couple of times. It's called Voresight. They did outsourced they did outsourced prospecting for companies. They were based down in Roslyn. And uh, the guy's name was Steve Richard. He was a good friend of ours. And they recorded sales calls. And they used artificial intelligence and analysis to to um, analyze the sales calls that your customers, uh, your salespeople were doing. They had recorded at the time, I interviewed him, over 5 million phone calls, 5 million phone calls. And I said to him, what is the number one thing you learned from these 5 million phone calls? And Tien, you know what he said? No follow-up. He said 50% of the calls did not have a follow-up did not have a, can we talk next Tuesday? I'm going to send you an email. Can we talk about it next Thursday? Let's schedule a Zoom right now to go over the email that I'm going to talk to you about. Can we come and talk to you about this email with this document that I'm going to be sending to you? And I've heard that time and time again. Even in some cases, you know, there's some studies that a sales may take 30, 40 interactions and people stop after three. You know, and you don't want to be a pest, but you know, if you're persistent and you understand what they need, you got to keep going. Follow up, you know, just to the next meeting and keep it scheduled. Get it on the calendar. Uh, the next time you meet in the meeting, get at your calendars and say, uh, you know, I want to do a follow up. Are you available next Thursday? And if they say, well, you know, we need some time, we bring some people, push for the meeting. You know, say, well, I really want to make sure that you you get this. Everybody has great first meetings. You know, every customer wants to meet with a technology vendor if they can, especially people down in the ranks and the director and manager of IT level, because they want to they want to see it. They want to play with it. They want to know about it. There's a big difference between that first call and actually getting to the second call. You know, it's easy to get to a first call. Getting to the second call, that's the home run. But you must follow up. And you have to do it every single time. And you can't depend on an email a week or two later. You got to do the follow-up on the call. I'm so amazed at how often that comes up. I'm also amazed that it continues to happen. All right, we actually have two more. Uh, Christine Barger from Salesforce. Every customer that you're dealing with is challenged with three things right now. Every customer that you're dealing with. doesn't matter if it's the biggest company in the world, or if it's like a two-person shop, whatever. It's emerging from the pandemic. What does that mean to your business? How do you need to be hybrid, whatever it might be? How do you now, how have you changed? You know, there's been a lot of social change over the last couple of years too. How has your company changed to bring in more women, to bring in more minorities, to support those type of entities? Is DE&I something that's a big deal with you? That's become a huge topic during uh, the last three years. Financial. Every company has some degree of financial challenge uh, you know, for whatever it might be, however it might be, restructuring, whatever it might be. You made acquisitions. You've had to cut. Every company is challenged with that. And whatever's third. You know, maybe your industry is still struggling to get back. Uh, you know, movies are now open. I went to a movie last Friday night at seven o'clock. I was the only person in the movie theater. So, you know, it may seem like things are kind of coming back, but everybody is still challenged with their own industry, something that's happening to themselves. Christine gave a great answer. And by the way, the other person in the picture is, uh, her name is Ivy Savoy Smith. She's with, um, uh, used to be Entercom Radio Networks. They do WJFK and other company, other radios like that. Um, Odyssey is the name of their company now. She said, plain and simple, and this show was a couple, a couple, about a year ago, we're trying to help our customers normalize. So the attitude of we're here to bring your value, we're here to help you figure out whatever you're challenged with from those three things. And like I said before, before you get on board with the customer, before they give you the courtesy of the meeting, no matter who you are, that you've thought through, you know, you have a plan for them. You're going to worry things, of course, but you've done the research. You know, there's a, a saying right now in the sales world that customers don't really need you sales professionals, salespeople, business owners anymore because they can go to the internet and do research. You know, the challenger sales said that most sales are 60% uh, through. Here's what's actually happened is that is true. They can get a lot of their content, obviously from the internet and social media and networking groups like that, organizational groups, but a lot of cases they're screwing it up. They think they know everything from what they're getting on the internet, but there's nuance that you bring as a sales professional and the solution provider. All right, last thing. I mentioned before that empathy 
was the number one word that we heard on all of the uh, South Game Changers podcast. Uh, I actually was wrong. The word is value. You know, salespeople are about providing value. You as a business owner is about providing value. You as a service provider to the Connectpreneur community, it's all about bringing value. And it's always been about bringing value, but it's gotten so critical over the last three years, Tien, that it's about really bringing value and bringing it to the customer as if you know what they're going through. So all as you see, a lot of these 10 things to end that we're seeing, they're all kind of coming together. You got to bring value. There's five ways that you could bring significant value to your specific customer, you know, information value, you know, you basically help them get across what they need to do. You've researched the industry, you know, fundamental value, basically to help them be more productive, to save more costs, to accelerate their go-to-market, whatever that may be. The unique value, how can you help them be different in the marketplace? And again, as a sales professional or as the new business owner or as the new entrepreneur, you know, you have to think about for this customer, this is what we're going to bring you. And it's not just we're going to make you more productive. And it's not just we're going to save you costs. It needs to be specific to them as you're communicating for what they're challenged with with their customers. Individual value, you know, helping the person who's going to make the decision. You know, almost any technology or any vendor that's going to be buying early stage technology is at risk. They're making a big risk to bring you in, to bring early stage technology in. So it needs to be uh, crisp and clear that you're going to help them in their individual goals, providing value to the rest of their organization. And of course, monetary value, return on investment. You know, this is a good investment for you to be making. Whew. All right. Those are the 10. And you know, Tian, as I'm thinking about this, we all 10 of them play together. You know, we've done individual shows. We've done... Uh, I've spoken to some of the most amazing sales leaders on the planet. Tian, I get 40 inquiries per week from people who want to be on the Sales Game Changers podcast because we've been recognized and there's ways to measure, you know, downloads and all those things. Um, I talk to sales leaders every day. Again, today's show was a VP of sales from BMC. Last week, we posted the show with Casey. Um, they all want to be on the show. And these are people who understand what's going on at the customer. So I appreciate that. I want to recognize, rec uh, whatever, I want to um, uh, repeat that, of course, on John New June 9th, we're going to be honoring uh, Tian Wan. We're also going to be honoring the uh, two of the top sales leaders at HPE, Susan Shapiro, who leads uh, HPE's public sector, Joe Ayers, who used to lead HPE. They're going to be receiving our Lifetime Achievement Award. Alyssa Merwin from LinkedIn is going to be receiving our Women in Sales Award. We also have the Jay Nussbaum Rising Sales Star. A guy named Bob Green is going to be our IES member of the year, and we'll have a sales speaker of the year. All right. Woo. Thank you all for listening. I saw that only one person dropped off. So uh, whoever that person is, you can listen to this again. For the over 80 people who stayed with me, thank you so much. My name is Fred Diamond. I'm in Northern Virginia. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. I'm on Facebook pretty much all the time as well talk to you about sales. We'd be thrilled to talk to you about things we've learned, things to talk to you about the women in sales. I know we have some questions. Um, also, just as an aside, I wrote a book on Lyme disease. Uh, I'm the first person on the planet who doesn't have Lyme disease or is not a medical professional who wrote a book. I also have a podcast called Love, Hope, Lyme, where we talk about chronic illness and Lyme disease. If that's affected you or your family, feel free to reach out to me as well. Thank you so much, Fred. We really appreciate uh, your wisdom. We have 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, I know we've got a bunch of questions that are uh, in the chat, and also Avery's got a few. So I'll turn it over to Avery, who will uh, moderate the Q&A piece. And again, type your questions into the chat box, or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you. Um, Avery. Thank you so much, Tian, and thank you, Fred, for the presentation. Uh, anyone who has any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. Uh, you can also DM me, um, and if you want to ask them verbally, you can raise your hand as well. All right, we're going to start with our first question here. How would you, Fred, approach to complex solution selling for luxury services and products that cost $15,000 or higher? Mm. 
luxury products for 15,000. Well, first of all, like everything that we're talking about here today as well, a big part of the sales process is qualification. You know, a lot of times, especially early stage companies, you know, like I mentioned before, you have a great first call. People are excited. You know, I've been in sales meetings where the sales professional would say something like, um, I had a great meeting, so there's a 50% chance that they're going to become a customer, when in reality, you know, they're probably 1% chance at that particular point. So there needs to be qualification. There needs to be understanding that, uh, uh, you know, that you're actually talking to somebody who can afford, you know, a $15,000 or above luxury item. I think you need to communicate the value. I think you need to communicate why you're different than the competition. And uh, uh, you need to be passionate about what you're doing. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> All right, next question. Would love to hear whether on first meeting or follow up, if he suggests meeting in person whenever geographically possible versus the Zoom world that we live in. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that hasn't, uh, we've all, I'm not going to say we've all, because we still do podcasts sometimes on how to present over Zoom, et cetera. And uh, the, the tactility of the in-person, the being able to look around the room, seeing things, having to get dressed, you know, those little nuances that bring it together. And that doesn't happen with Zoom. Uh, it, yeah, you could have a little bit of banter in the beginning. You could see something possibly. You do the research again, ahead of the call. So you'll know what that person is committed to. You'll know about hopefully where they went to school, maybe some charities that they're involved with that you can pepper into the conversation, but you got to get the in-person meetings. They will move your process so much further forward. And it's hard right now. Customers don't want that necessarily. There's more security, but if ever you can get into the room with them, so much more happens. Thank you, Fred. Next question. What advice do you have helping customers get comfortable with the risk of adopting early stage technology? Yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, most of my career was in technology marketing. Uh, I was at Apple for a long time, Compaq Computer for a long time, and a large software company called CompuWare. And you know, I, I noticed that whenever we launched a new product, even at those companies that were obviously world-class, well-established companies, you know, there was always a slow rollout. There was always a pilot. There was always um, a controlled um, a controlled process to see if it would work in the environment, how their users would handle the products as well. Uh, you got to find the entity that is willing to take those risks. You know, it is a risk. Here's one of the commonalities that we talk about a lot. One of the commonalities with the customer in technology, every customer in technology has one commonality. They don't want to get fired for bringing in bad products. They don't want to put their career at risk because they made a mistake, be it with a $15,000 investment or a $500 million investment, whatever it might be. So you got to seek out the department, uh, the places within the customer that might be willing to bring new technologies in. Maybe you get a champion, maybe you see someone at a trade show, which are coming back, or you find somebody on LinkedIn who is willing to take a controlled pilot shot. And that's in most cases, what technology companies that are emerging in startup have to do is to get on board with some type of pilot. They're not going to make a massive change by bringing in whatever it is you do. It's going to be controlled in almost every situation. Thank you. Next question is, why didn't you list sales tech as a top 10 issue? That's a great question, whoever submitted that one. And uh, also, I'm glad to see that, that Roselle had Alex Goldfein uh, present to her company. Uh, you know, it's funny, before the pandemic, there were about 1,500 sales tech products. Now there's close to 10,000 sales tech products that, quote unquote, enhance the sales process. Um, some do, some don't. Most get purchased and then they never get used. Sales tech is important. It is, you know, figuring out ways to do some research, those kinds of things. It's really not about, um, it's really not about the tech. It really is about the process. It really is about a lot of the things that we talked about before, having the plan and figuring out ways to show the customer that you're bringing them value that's going to help them achieve what they need to achieve. We're not against tech. We, we review tech all the time. Uh, and the tech ain't going to make the difference in the sale. 
It's really understanding that you're bringing value to the customers. Thank you, Fred. You're welcome. Our next question is, I am looking for a sales head and revenue channel growing. Where can I find quality hires? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. In the very beginning of when I was doing those interviews face-to-face and I would go to sales VP's offices, one of the questions I would ask is, what is the two bigger or what are the two biggest challenges you face as a sales leader? And hiring and recruiting came up 70% 70% of the time. Matter of fact, that's actually what changed the mission of the Institute for Excellence in Sales to helping uh, employers attract, retain, motivate, and elevate top tier talent. I interviewed a guy named Frank Passante, who is the uh, Passanante, who's the senior VP for Hilton USA. He's based in Tyson's Corner. Um, and I asked him that question, and he said, Every sales leader is challenged with hiring and recruiting. So I'm not even going to say that's one of my top two challenges. That's table stakes. My top two challenges are whatever it might be, uh, training people, or I forget what he answered. You can go to salesgamechangerspodcast.com and type in Frank to find out what he said. It's hard. It is really hard. Um, It is hard because uh, there's a war for great people, you know, Great salespeople, you know, there's good salespeople and there's great salespeople. I interviewed uh, one person on the podcast and um, actually a little bit of a different twist. I actually went to a company to do a presentation on sales careers and there were 30 people in the room and the VP of sales, and they were younger. They were people first, second, third year out of college, mostly doing business development, SDR type uh, roles. And I asked the question of you 30. How many of you think you're going to be in sales in two years? And Tien, how many of the 30 do you think raise their hand? All of them. Five. <laughs> Five wow. raise their hand. And I'm standing next to the VP. And I said to them, why do you think you're not going to be in sales in three years? Well, it's really hard. I thought I was going to make $100,000, but I have to make a lot of phone calls. How about you? Well. You know, I don't like talking to people on the phone as much as I thought I would. So I'm going to go work for a not-for-profit. Okay. Meanwhile, the five that said, you know, Mr. Diamond, yes, yes. They were like right in front of me, like scribbling everything that I uttered. I said to the sales leader afterwards, I said, what was that all about? With 25 of your people saying that they're not going to be in sales. Are you concerned? He said, no. He said, because we need to constantly replenish. And he said, but you know what? If three of those five have a good year, then we're going to have a great year. We're going to make our numbers. If three of those five, and if the other two are okay, we're going to have a blowout year. So I need those 25 to just kind of, I use the analogy of being a baseball pitcher in August. You know, you need nine innings on a hot Sunday in August. But and we've seen this time and time again. It's like the top 20% are the ones who are doing 80% of the business, you know, the 80-20 rule. And it's everywhere we talk to, from the larger companies to small companies, et cetera. So as far as finding talent, you know, for someone who's really good at sales to leave, now let's say if they were laid off. One thing I've seen recently is on LinkedIn, people who are rift for whatever reason are now saying, I'm excited to be at this new company. And then I go to LinkedIn and I see the new company doesn't have 50,000 employees. There's 800. So there's great talent out there who is looking for their next opportunity and will go to a much smaller company. To go to a really small company, a startup, it's very difficult for someone who's very, very successful at a top tier or even mid-tier company to take the risk of going to a startup. No, if, If they have a lot of money, maybe they're willing, maybe they've always wanted to do it. But go through LinkedIn, you know, there's hire, there's a contract recruiter does a great company uh, that we work with called uh, Talent Remedy, Stephanie Eberhardt and her company, who is knocking it out of the park. She was actually in one of the pictures I had with the books. So it's a, tr- it's a struggle. You got to do a lot of great selling to get good people at your company. Brady, I have a follow-up question to the question about talent, which is money motivation. Like well, you and I are a little bit older than most of the people on this call probably. And when we started out, had a lot of meat eating, baby boomers doing B2B sales. We always looked for people that were driven by money. You know, you hear about this salesperson being coin operated and, you know, it sounds like of the 30 people that chose sales as a profession back in the eighties, when you and I started, 
I'd say most people would want to stay in because they chose sales because they want to put food on the table and and build a nice career. But do you think it's a generational thing that maybe today's new hires are less quote unquote, you know, money motivated? What are your thoughts on all that? That's a great. How does somebody like us that were trying to hire talent, how do we frame these kinds of um, attractions to, to get these people to come work for us? You know, that's a great question. And I, I don't want to miss answer by saying, oh, money isn't that important anymore. It is. Sales is probably, besides being a successful entrepreneur who could, you know, uh, obviously uh, create a great company and, and get some great transactions, the sales professionals at companies are the most highly rewarded people because they have the hardest job. They have to bring in business from people who aren't necessarily that interested in in you know doing business per se, um, making money is still a driver for sales. But here's what we hear: we hear more and more things. Um, we run a very very successful women in sales program, like I mentioned. We polled a whole bunch of women in sales recently, and yes, earning a good living is uh, it's a top five thing. I'm not gonna we're not gonna negate that. But working for a company that is committed to social justice was on that top five list. Working for a company that is committed to sustainability was a top seven answer on that list. Working for a company that respects me as a sales professional, that respects the sales profession, that respects me as a woman in sales, has mentors, coaching, those kinds of things. They've risen up the bar. Now, if I'm only going to pay you a cap of 50000 to be my top salesperson, yeah, obviously they ain't going to go there. So you do have to compensate them and they will ask for the right compensation for the work. But there's other factors. One thing that we just launched at the Institute is our premier women in sales employer designation. We're announcing that on March 30th and we're recognizing companies that are exceptional companies for women. And we created that because the women who are in our programs said, I, I want a mentor. You know, I want to know that there are openings for me to grow in my career. You know, I'm going to work hard. They'll work hard. And I'm going to get to, I want to get to the VP level. Is there an opportunity for that? Prove to me that there is. Career growth. You know, security is one that's even more important that really wasn't a huge thing for the sales professional. But, you know, working for a company uh, that I can trust, et cetera. Now, there's, of course, some ironies with that because of all the layoffs. Companies that have said, we're very family oriented, of course, have done layoffs. But uh, now, let's not be mistaken. The ability to earn a great paycheck is a critical reason for moving into sales, choosing where you're going to work. There's other factors as well. Great question. Thank you so much, Fred. All right. We have a few more questions here. What tips do you have for keeping engagement with buyers who say they're interested seven months from now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, especially in a lot of the technologies, uh, like I said, it's a process. You know, no one's going to be buying your product after the first call. It's going to take uh, time and energy and months. You got to stay in relationship. You know, people talk about the word nurture. You know, you really do got to stay in contact. And you also need to have that plan of when you're going to research, you know, and what you're going to do for that customer. We like to treat customers, uh, and this came up a couple of times on the podcast, treat prospects as if they're customers. No, of course, that doesn't mean give them free things, give away the shop type of a thing, but bring them into your circle, give them some information, show them that you care, right? Show them that you're thinking about them. Show them, uh, like we talked before about the preparation, and a lot of the preparation uh, is um, thinking about them. You know, thinking about what their industry is. You know, it's even simple things. I'm not a huge person that sends a lot of uh, links to articles, but in this particular situation, you know, maybe it would be, you know, just to continue to stay in touch. But you got to stay in touch. You can't forget. You got to include them as if they're a, uh, as if they're a customer, and and bring them into the family. Make some introductions. Thank you, Fred. Next question is, any thoughts on pre-selling a crowdfunding campaign? No. To be honest with you, that's something I really can't speak to. Tan may be better. Maybe there's someone better on the line who can answer that question. I will remind people, though, on June 9th, we're going to be having our... (laughs) We're going to be having our award event. Where we're going to be recognizing Tian Wang as the Entrepreneur Sales Leader of the Year. So uh, we'll take those questions too. 
All right. Next question. I am based in India, and whom should I approach in the mid-sized company? CTO, director, etc. Well, it's like we talked about before. That's kind of a broad question, and it depends on you know the the size of the company and and those kinds of things. Um, like I mentioned on one of the first slides, you know the CTO is not going to take your call, no matter where you're from. Uh, unless you're from a vendor that they're working with right now today, or if you've sold to them before. So in that particular situation, it doesn't really matter where you're from. You got to figure out um, who can I start the process of connecting to, knowing that someone that's junior in the organization, they'll probably take your call because they're looking for ways to get smarter and technology wise. You got to put together a plan just to say, yeah, go after the CTO. You got to put together a plan for that customer. And this is one of the problems. Uh, LinkedIn, we, we have this expression, uh, connect and pitch. You know, and everybody here who's watching today's uh, masterclass has probably gotten outreach from people, and they may be in India or other places and even in the States. You know, hey, I offer you a, I have a, I want to connect with you because I think I have something of value. And then you accept the connection and then boom, you know, there's the pitch, you know, here's the subscription. Uh, let's get started. Oh, I just met you. I don't even know you exist. I don't even know your product. You know, when customers are buying, it's a decision process. You know, customers are so thoughtful now of what they bring into their company to help them achieve what's become priorities over the last three years, like I mentioned in that second to last slide. So just say, go after the CTO. Sure, you're probably not going to be successful, but you got to figure out who at that customer uh, you need to talk to. And there's ways to get that information. You know, there's Zoom info, there's other tools out there. Um, you could use LinkedIn Navigator to find out who some of those critical people are. But just lobbying bobs in, uh, bombs in isn't going to get you anywhere, to be honest with you, unless you're extremely lucky and it's very rare. Thank you, Fred. Our next question is, what advice do you have for building channel partnerships? I run a B2B corporate wellness service. So there's two, there's basically two different ways for channel. There's channel that is going to sell your products, that's going to bring your products to the marketplace. As a matter of fact, a lot of my career was in, in channel design and channel theory. Uh, who, and, and even of a channel, maybe 10% of your channel is going to be very, very impactful to you. Um, that's kind of like an industry standard. Maybe it's 20% for technology products being sold. So who really is getting to your customer that offers a complimentary solution that would want to invest their company's time and energy and reputation into bringing your products to the marketplace? The other is, you know, where is there a complimentary solution for your customer on the other hand, not just you and the vendor, but from your customer's perspective, um, what else can be, who else are they looking for, for advice, solutions, and, and, and ideas? Thank you, Fred. Our next question is, where do I find more info on women in sales group? Sure. Go to my website, uh, the Institute for Excellence in Sales. I believe it's in the chat or you could just put it back in, Avery, uh, i4esbd.com slash women in sales. And thank you for that. The Institute for Excellence in Sales, we are the center of excellence for corporate women in sales best practices. Thank you, Fred. And I did post that in the chat for anyone who would like to go check that out. Our next question is, what are your best advice for products that offer a free trial or a freemium subscription model? Yeah, to be honest with you, I'm not the best person to answer that question either. All right. Let's see. Any more questions? Um, I'm going to give what? a shout out to my friend, uh, Beth Berman. Hi, Beth. <laughs> So many right. people on the call today. Thank you guys for joining us. We are up against our deadline and we like to start and end on time when we can stick around maybe for a few more minutes if anyone has any burning questions or wants to say some things to Fred. But I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. I'd especially like to thank Fred for sharing his uh, wisdom. Those top 10, it's empirical data. So I, I like numbers that are backed up by, you know, um, by, uh, by num by by uh, data, you know, and and it's it's great that those are the top ten sort of uh, pieces of advice that have 
come to the four in 600 podcasts. So really, thank you for sharing that. It's very valuable. Um, and um, yeah, I'd like to remind everybody again that next week we have an awesome masterclass as well. Stay tuned. We do these uh, three times a month-ish. Beth will be doing one um, in the coming months, as, as will Deborah Fell. So please stay tuned and, and feel free to join us at that time. 